Begin when ready. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and again, Senators, uh, good morning. I'm here today to present AB 1955, the Support Academic Futures and Educators for Today's Youth Act, or the Safety Act. Since 2020, there's been a growing national attack on LGBTQ people, with a number of states and California school districts enacting policies that explicitly require teachers to notify parents if their child identifies as transgender. These policies are known as forced outings. Forced outing policies that require exposing students without their consent harms everyone's parents, families, and school staff, and importantly, those students, by unnecessarily pitting students at risk and removing the opportunities for families to build trust and have conversations on their own terms. Although many LGBTQ youth have supportive families, some unfortunately continue to face rejection and are exposed to serious harm if prematurely forced to reveal their identity. Young people thrive when they have a parental support and feel safe sharing their authentic selves at home. In fact, when LGBTQ youth have their parents' support, they have stability and they feel safe sharing their identities with them. Unfortunately, not all young people are able to be their authentic selves, and it can be, it can be harmful for LGBTQ youth to share their full identities before they're ready. Forced outing policies have a measurable impact on the mental health of LGBTQ students and have led to a rise in bullying, harassment, and discrimination. We all know that when one population of the student body is bullied, harassed, and discriminated against, all students are impacted. As was stated by Kai, a LGBTQ youth who bravely joined us in announcing this important piece of legislation, students who've been forcibly outed before they are ready face harassment and abuse both at school and at home. Consequences of such bullying, harassment, and abuse have contributed to LGBTQ students getting kicked out of their houses and unfortunately, some attempting to take their own lives. Had it not been for an empathetic teacher who allowed Kai to be able to come out to his parents on his own terms, he not only would have been deprived at the time excuse of the time. Excuse me. I'd ask the audience to please give the author and all other witnesses a chance to speak. Uh, and if you don't do that, we'll have you removed. Please continue. Kai's truth was that because of an empathetic teacher, he was able to come out to his parents on his own terms. If not for that, he wouldn't have been able, he would have been deprived of the time needed to form some of the best discussion with his family when coming out. But he also shared that he would not be with us today. His story is one of countless youth who are heavily impacted by forced outing policies that target LGBTQ youth in our state. Forced outing policies uh, not only run contrary to academic research, but also the laws and policies that target or invite targeting of students on the basis of gender or sexual orientation, which are prohibited under state and federal law. As such, I partner with my colleagues on the Legislative LGBTQ Caucus to introduce the Safety Act to strengthen existing protections against forced outings of students in schools. First, it does four things. The Safety Act prohibits and invalidates any policy, rule, or administrative regulation that requires a forced outing. Second, this bill affirms that teachers and employees shall not discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity of students and shall not be compelled to disclose such an identity unless required to do so by law, such as due to suspicion of harm as mandated reporters. Third, this bill protects teachers from facing retaliation for simply doing their jobs, teaching and providing a safe school environment. And fourth, the Safety Act provides parents, guardians, and families of LGBTQ students with critical resources in order to support them in working towards acceptance on their own terms without interference from others. Now, by strengthening some of the existing protections and supporting families, we will ensure that all students are safe, supported, and not isolated due to any part of their identity, as well as to ensure that families are able to have personal conversations and work towards family acceptance on their own terms. With me to speak in support of this bill is Christy Hurst, a parent and the co-founder of Our Schools USA, and Shay Stevens, a, te a teacher and parent herself. Also here is Jennifer Chow, the interim director and staff attorney with the ACLU, to answer any technical questions. Welcome. Hi. Is this good? It's great. Okay. Good morning, my name is Christy Hurst. I am a public school parent of three children and also the co-founder of Our Schools USA, a national nonprofit dedicated to protecting quality public education for all students. Parents across California contact us daily concerned about forced outing policies and the extremist school boards that pass them. 
the parents span a variety of races, ethnicities, classes, political groups, and religious views. They're united in recognizing forced outing is harmful, does nothing to improve education, and is a waste of public resources. After Chino passed forced outing policy last July, I received dozens of letters from students, parents, teachers, and community members, and I've provided them for you. They said, my child is actually not safe at their school. I'm a teacher who hears how afraid students are of this policy. Not only is this discriminatory, they also create a climate of fear and bullying in schools that's bad for all my students. This district needs to stop wasting our tax dollars and start doing what benefits all our children. Forced outing has made our district the subject of ridicule and mockery. It damages our community, its image, and also affects our home values, which are closely tied to the reputation of our school district. My family has started looking into other school districts. Parents did not ask for a school board to dictate how we raised our children. Students said, I feel belittled, uncomfortable, and unsafe in my school. The district's job is not to protect the feelings of parents. It's to ensure the safety of all students. I should not be forced to tell my parent who says slurs against LGBTQ people that I am what they hate. I am afraid that I will be cast away from my family if they find out. Students and their families cannot survive another year of this not being resolved by the state because the extremists won't stop wasting public money on their political crusades. The time to resolve any ambiguity is now. Pass the Safety Act because we need quality public education and safe learning environments. We need school boards to be focused on educating kids, not political crusades. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Stevens, welcome. Thank you. Please proceed when ready. Okay, um, good morning. My name is Shay Stevens and I'm a high school teacher in one of the 12 districts that has passed a forced outing policy. I'd like to share a personal story about the impact this has had on the culture and safety of our school. When we became privy to the fact that our board would be voting on this policy, we encouraged our students to come to the board meeting and be part of the democratic process. Inevitably, many in our LGBTQ student community felt compelled to attend. We sat in our school's library listening to grown adults berate our most vulnerable students by referring to them as abominations, accusing them of pedophilia, and calling them all sorts of dehumanizing names. Some even brought prepared signs to hold up in front of the crowd. Only one identifying student spoke at the podium amid sneers and whispers. As I looked around the room, many of the kids sat in silence, tears streaming down their faces, unable to find the courage to stand up and defend themselves against those who are supposed to protect them. Encouraging those students to attend that meeting was the greatest mistake of my career. Since then, it has been one discriminatory policy after the next, from the ban of all flags save the American or state flag, to attempts to ban mental health services for our students. Board meetings have gone from traditional 45 minutes to four to six hours. We are chasing our tails, trying to do our day jobs, while also fighting to maintain a safe and healthy environment for our students. It has become blatantly clear that this push from the outside, from outside political propagandists has nothing to do with parental rights and everything to do with discrimination against our most vulnerable populations. This imbalance of power has made it clear that I, having the privilege of being an educator with a voice, had to come here today and speak to the damage these rogue boards are doing to our children. Student safety should never be compromised by extreme ideology. It is our solemn duty to protect and serve every student in our classrooms. Please allow us to teach in a welcoming environment where children feel safe. Stand with educators and pass Assembly Bill 1955. Thank you. 
Thank you for your testimony. Uh, at, at this point, I'd ask any members of the public who'd like to come forward and testify and support the bill uh, to come to the microphone uh, and state your name, your organization, and your position only. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Uh, good morning, Craig Pulsford here today on behalf of Proyecto Translatina, San Diego Pride, San Joaquin Pride Center, the Translatina Coalition, Tom Homan LGBTQ Law Association, and Westside Activists and Our Schools LA. Thank you. Next, please. Uh, my name is Tony Huang. Uh, on behalf of Equality California, we respectfully ask for an I vote. Thank you. Kathy Mullig, she, her, Trans Family Support Services, I vote, as well as American Atheists the California LULAC, California School-Based Alliance, Heart of LA Democratic Club, the Inland Empire Prism Collective, and the LGBTQ Center of Orange County. Thank you. Next, please. Nicole Morales on behalf of Children Now and Strong Support. Thank you. Next. Shonda Wesley on behalf of Our Families, Our Voices, and Strong Support. And on behalf of the following allies, parents and family who have asked me to express their support for AB 1955, Misko Boudreau and Erica Bauman Whittier, Nicole and David Beckstrand El, El Cajon, Claire DeVries Folsom, Mara Hui Sacramento, Christy Barnes West Sacramento, Emmy Le Emily Levy Santa Cruz, Claudia Vieira Allen Elena Sobrante, Jillian Levi Escondido. Josh Clark, Sacramento, Monica Tarbuskovich, Mather, Dana Watts, Orange County, Peter Dolan, Jeff Inslee, Chico, and from Sacramento, Kristen Wagner, Kim McElnay, Queen Boos, Nicole Roberts, Morgan Cotton, Stephanie Baxter, Kelly Stout, Kristen Stout, Paula Knoll, Elizabeth Campbell, Renani Stokes, Christina Niemi, Melanie Bean, and Valerie Oldham. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Sylvia Romo from Sacramento with the Building Skills Partnership, also a parent of a trans youth and strong support. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Emily Lowe, parent from Davis in support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Frank Bailey, Greater Placer County, P flag, in support of this bill. Thank you. Next, please. Diane Bailey um, for P Flag, Greater Placer County. I have a trans son and uh, in strong support. Thank you. Next, please. My name is Laura Barrett. I live in Sacramento and I have a non binary youth in my family. I'm here to support this bill, AB 1955. Thank you. Next, please. Hi, Annie Chow with the California Teachers Association in support also on behalf of the LA LGBT Center, North County LGBT Resource Center, One Institute, Our Family Coalition, Our Schools USA Carlsbad, and PFLAG Fresno. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Hi, my name is Kristen Milliken. I live in Sacramento. I have a non-binary youth in my family. And I'm here to, uh, because I strongly support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Jackie, Jackie Howard with California Teachers Association on behalf of my three kiddos in Placer County Schools. Thank you. Next. Hi, my name is Randy K. Stevens. I'm a parent here in Sacramento. I want all of our schools to be a safe place for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Committee. I'm Karen Humphrey. I'm with the National Women's Political Caucus of California, and we support this bill. Thank you. Next, please. Hi, I'm Sue Granzella, retired member of, from 32 years as a CTA member, and I'm in strong support of this bill. Thank you. Next, please. Tiffany Mock on behalf of CFT in strong support. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Kat Bess on behalf of the California Alliance of Child and Family Services in support. Thank you. Next, please. Dr. Jonathan Higgins um, with Rainbow Pride Youth Alliance here to support this bill. Thank you. Next, please. Uh, Kanan Durham of Pride of the Pier in Orange County and a trans man, and I support this bill. Thank you. Next, please. Hi, my name is Bree from Glendora. I'm a queer non-binary educator, and on behalf of myself and every single LGBTQ youth who is no longer with us and cannot speak for themselves, I speak in strong support of this bill Thank because you. every child needs a supportive learning. Thank you. 
I'm Angie Gavant on behalf of Glendale Unified Parents for Public Schools, and we're in strong support of passing AB 1955. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Jessica Gache, San Mateo, board member, P Flag, San Jose Peninsula, strong support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Claudia Silva, elementary school teacher, and strong support of this bill. Thank you. Next, please. Laura, public parent, public school parent of two children, and I support this bill. Thank you. Next, please. Jessica Marquez, on behalf of State Superintendent uh, Public Instruction, Tony Thurman, in proud support. Thank you. Next, please. Good morning. My name is Linda Ortega from the Mount Diablo Education Association in the Concord area. I am a proud auntie of trans transgender um, children, students, and um, a sister. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. My name's Ann Bowler from Placer County, and I'm in strong support of this bill. Thank you. Next, please. Millie Yan, a parent of public school kids in Placer County, and I'm here in support of AB 1955. Thank you. Next, please. Hello. Jacob Daruvala from the Inland Empire, representing parent Renee Boyardo, the Trans Youth Liberation and Divine Truth Unity Fellowship Church. And we are in favor of this bill. Thank you. Next, please. Hi, my name is Michelle Tong. I'm with Our Schools Placer, and I'm in strong support of AB 1955. Thank you. Next, please. Rex Carpenter, I'm with Placer County. I strongly support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. My name is Meg Weiss. I'm with Our Schools Placer, and I strongly support this bill. Thank you. Next, please. Hi, my name is Daisy Catherine Gardner. I am with Our Schools USA Los Angeles. I am a parent of public school children and a LGBTQ youth. Um, I'm also here for Safe Redland Schools, Trisha Keeling, Amber Easley, and others in strong support of this bill. Thank you so much for considering. Thank you. Next, please. Good morning, my name is Dr. Emily Mitchell. My pronouns are she and her, and I am here representing the California Community College LGBTQ Plus Advisory Committee, and we are in strong support of this bill. Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Next, please. Ellen debach Riley, proud citizen of the LGBT community, and hoping this bill will pass because it will protect today's youth Thank against you. what my generation experienced. Thank you. Thank Next, you. please. Barbara Brass, leader of the Rat Pack, Resistance Action Tuesdays and Thursdays in Placer County. I support this as does my organization. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Good morning. Celia Medina Owens, proud public school teacher, second graders at Foothill Elementary in Pittsburgh, California, and I strongly support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. My name is Bob Carson. I'm a proud educator from Antioch, and I strongly support this bill. Thank you. Next, please. My name is Dr. Rob Dara. I'm from Santa Cruz. I'm a parent. I am a lifelong K-12 educator in California. I'm an adjunct professor in the credential program at CSU Monterey Bay and also director of professional learning for the Safe Schools Project of Santa Cruz County. And our organization strongly supports this bill. Thank you. Next, please. I'm Julian Jacaranda Jacqueline. I'm a student speaking on behalf of queer youth and students from Santa Cruz and all across the county country to say that we all show support for this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Hi, Sean McMullen Chen. I'm a teacher, high school teacher in Manhattan Beach, California, and parent and resident of Manhattan Beach, California, in strong support of this bill. Thank you. Next, please. Good morning. Marcella Chagoya, 25-year-long uh, career educator, middle school, my entire career, here in support of this bill, for uh, representing United Teachers Los Angeles and LAUSD and California Federation of Teachers and uh, CTA. Thank you. Hello, Talia diaz Cataño. I'm a proud parent of a first grader and also a public school educator in Boyle Heights in LA, and I'm in support of this bill. Thank you. Next, please. Hi, my name is Katherine Eisenstein. I'm an educator at LAUSD. I'm representing UTLA, CTA, CFT, and as the aunt of a child who is non-binary, I strongly support this. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Eve Bannis with the Sacramento LGBT Community Center in strong support. Thank you. Next, please. 
Good morning, uh, Jesse Aguilar. I'm a high school art teacher in Bakersfield. I've been teaching for the last 28 years, and I strongly support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Good morning. I'm Hector Vega here on behalf of the Asociación de Maestros Unidos. I'm a U.S. history teacher in Los Angeles, and I strongly support this bill. Thank you. Next, please. Good morning, Jay Mason, uh, proud educator from Campbell, California, in strong support of this bill. Thank you. Next, please. Hi, Renata Sanchez. I am an elementary school instructional coach where I work primarily with probationary teachers gaining their credentials um, and from San Jose, and I stand in support. Thank you. Next, please. Hi there. I'm Allison Clavey, high school special education teacher in Palos Verdes, and I strongly support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Hello, my name is Dane Contarsi. I'm a teacher at Hawthorne High School. I teach world history, AP economics, AP government, and AVID, and Hawthorne High School, Sentinel Valley Secondary Teachers Association, and CTA support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. David Navarre, public school teacher and father of public school students and strong support. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Angela De Ramos, fifth grade teacher and a school board trustee in Salinas, and I support this bill. Thank you. Next, please. Good morning, Kim Lewis, representing the California Coalition for Youth and Support. Thank you. Next, please. Good morning. My name is Maureen Quiroz Gray. I'm an educator um, in Norwalk and La Mirada, and I strongly support this bill. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Ishmael Armendariz, president of the Oakland Education Association, and on behalf of our 3,000 members, we strongly support. Thank you. Next, please. Hi, I'm Kristen Loivenos. I'm a secondary English teacher in Compton, California, and I strongly support this bill. Thank you. Next, please. Hi, I am Colonel Pat Thompson, and I served 37 years in military service to our country, and I strongly support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Next, please. Hi, I'm Stephen Fraser, science teacher in Chino, California, and I'm here in support of this bill. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tracy Taylor. I'm an elementary school teacher in Ontario, Montclair, and I strongly support this bill. Thank you. Next, please. Good morning. My name is Wei Su Lo. I'm a school psychologist for uh, children from K to uh, high school, and I strongly support this bill from Pomona. Thank you. Good morning. Aston Williams, California LGBTQ Health and Human Services Network, and we strongly support. Thank you. Good morning, Molly Robeson with Planned Parenthood Affiliates of California and Strong Support. Thank you. Jeannie Kim, law student and public of California, or product of California Public Schools and Strong Support. Thank you. Kathy Mossberg on behalf of the APLA Health, San Francisco AIDS Foundation, and End the Epidemics Coalition, all in Strong Support. Thank you. My name is Stanley Clover. My pronouns are he, they. I'm a proud trans man, and I strongly support this bill. Thank you. Good morning. I'm the Reverend Alex De Silva Soto. My pronouns are they, them, and theirs. And I serve with Sierra Foothills Unitarian Universalist and strong support of this bill and gratitude for it. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Hi, thank you for your time. My name is Alicia Watkins. I'm a journalist with the Voices of Placer. And uh, as a member of the 2SLGBTQIA+, and a parent of a 2SLGBTQIA+, student, I am in strong and passionate support of this bill. Thank, thank you. you for your consideration. Thank you. Next, please. Carrie Fantham, um, Placer County parent of an LGBTQ plus student. I am in strong support of this bill. Thank you. Thank Next, you. please. Good morning, Faith Lee with Asian Americans Advancing Justice, Southern California. We're in proud support. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Duke Cooney on behalf of ACLU California Action and Strong Support. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Dr. Amber Bradley, government teacher representing the Washington Unified School District in West Sacramento, and I'm in strong support of this bill. Thank you. Next, please. Megan Ellsburn, 7th and 8th grade teacher, president of Laguna Salada Education Association in Pacifica School District in strong support. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Hello, Rachel Merlo from Pacifica, both parent and public school teacher for middle school, and I am in strong support. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Good morning, Chelsea Grow, parent of three children in um, Elk Grove Unified School District, and I am here in opposition of this bill. Thank you. This is support. Next, please. Good morning, Shannon Catanella. I am a resident of California. I am the parent of three children spanning three districts in California in the Placer area, and I strongly support the protections of this bill. 
Thank you. Uh, to the sergeants, anybody else outside? Okay, that's all the support. So terrific. Uh, at this point, we do have a quorum. Uh, let me get that established. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Newman. Here. Newman here. Ochobog. Here. Ochobog here. Cortese. Here. Cortese here. Glazer. Present. Glazer present. Gonzalez. Here. Gonzalez here. Smallwood Cuevas. Wilk. Present. Wilk present. Okay. Uh, we do now have a quorum, and now we will move on to opposition. Uh, to the measure. So for the principal witnesses in opposition to the measure, please come forward to the table. Uh, and as you do, let's welcome Julie from Missouri, uh, who is watching loyally as she always does. All right, I show two principal witnesses, uh, Ms. Aurora Regino and Dr. Arthur Delora Mir. Um, which of you would like to go first? I can go first. I can go do. first. You, you like the other witnesses, you have three minutes. Please proceed. All right. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Aurora Regino. Until the events evolving my daughter, I was a registered Democrat. I voted for same sex marriage. I am a plaintiff in a lawsuit that I filed against Chico Unified School District for their secret social transition of my 11-year-old daughter. In the fall of 2022, following the death of her grandfather, my daughter was depressed. I also had breast cancer and our family was going through a difficult time. My daughter was influenced by her school to believe that her sadness was because she was really a boy. When she told a school counselor that she felt this way, the counselor did not tell me. Instead, without contacting me, the counselor and my daughter's teacher arranged for the entire school to be, begin using a male name that my daughter had picked out and referred to her with the male pronouns. The school cemented and encouraged this male identity for my daughter behind my back. Over that period, my daughter's depression worsened. Finally, my daughter told her grandmother, my mother, about what was going on at school. My mother told me I was horrified that the school had done this without even informing me. My daughter was just confused about her identity. When I learned of what was going on, I was able to get my daughter the therapy she needed. But because she had been socially transitioned at school, she felt trapped in the new boy identity that the school was encouraging. She continued to go by the boy's name and pronouns for the rest of the school year because she felt trapped. My daughter still struggles with her mental health today. Later, when I complained to the school about what had happened, I learned about the school's parental secrecy policy, which takes parents out of the equation. This drives a wedge between the parent and child. I understand my daughter's school continues to deceive parents to this day. Had I not found out what the school was doing to my daughter, she likely would have kept identifying as a boy. Like many children, she probably would also have moved towards irreversible medical interventions like a mastectomy. Before I learned what was going on, she had already had conversations about breast binding with the school counselor. AB 1955 is misnamed. It should be called School Secrets Act because that's what it is. If it passes, children will be irreversibly harmed. Schools should not keep secrets about children's acute distress with their body. Gender, gender dysphoria can be a serious conditions, condition, and parents need to be involved in their children's treatment. If you want to prevent suicide in trans-identified children, you involve parents. Parents are the people who love their ch children the most and unconditionally. Gender, gender dysphoria is a mental health issue completely different from sexual orientation and dysphoric children need help from their parents, not secrecy from their school. The Children's Secret Act puts vulnerable children at risk when they need their parents the most. I am not the only parent with this story. Read Duty's opposition letter. Vote no on AB1955. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lormier, am I pronouncing it correctly? Uh, close enough. My name is Dr. Arthur Lormier. I am a chief of pediatric gastroenterology at the University of California at Davis. I am a clinical professor and I care for trans identified children. My com comments are strictly my own uh, opinion as a pediatrician and a California native and are not intended to represent the position of the University of California. A transgender child is a child with a gender identity disorder or gender dysphoria under the current diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders. The dysphoria is characterized by a child's severe and persistent discomfort with his or her sex. 
Until about a decade ago, gender dysphoria afflicted fewer than 0.01% of the population and mostly young males. That figure began increasing exponentially right around the time schools started teaching that a person can be born in the wrong body. Social media contributed to this massive surge in adolescents, mostly females, into adopting trans identities. Last year, Reuters reported that in 2016, there were 1,000 California kids diagnosed as gender dysphoric. By 2020, that number had tripled, and that increase continues to steadily, steadily climb. Nothing in medicine increases like that without external forces. The CAS review published last month is the largest systematic review in the world regarding gender dysphoric youth. The report raises significant concerns about socially transitioning minors using new names or pronouns or whatever, stating that the transition is not a neutral act, but a profound psychological intervention with potentially irreversible consequences. The CAS review also noted that dysphoria is often combined with other acute mental health issues that must be addressed. Dr. Cass found the quality of the evidence to transition minors was, quote, disappointingly poor. New court documents reveal that the Johns Hopkins 2020 review re uh, reached the same conclusion. Parents must be involved in their gender dysphoric children at the inception of the adoption of a new identity. Schools should not conduct psychological interventions without parent parental consent. Parents play the most vital role in the physical and mental wellness of their children. Gender dysphoric youth are at greater risk of suicide than their peers from the distress of the dysphoria, not from being unaffirmed. Keeping the behavior of these vulnerable children secret from their parents is ill-advised at best. I urge you to oppose AB 1955 in any form, and I'm happy to take your questions. Uh, thank you. We'll get to questions. Uh, please hold your applause. Are there any members of the public who'd like to come forward in opposition to the measure? If so, please come forward to the microphone. As with the supporters, we would ask you to state your name, your organization, and your position on the measure, uh, and that is all. Good morning. I'm also here as, as a technical witness if you need one on the law. My name is Erin Friday. I'm a licensed attorney. I represent our duty, Protect Kids California, and Democrats for an informed approach to gender. I'm a mother of a daughter who used to believe that she was a boy. Thank you. My name is Denise Aguilar, co-founder of Freedom Angels in Opposition. Also speaking on behalf of Sonia Shaw of Chino Valley School District in Opposition. Thank you. Next, please. Tara Thornton, co-founder of Freedom Angels, and on behalf of all the Californians that don't know about AB 1955 um, and support and do not support parental alienation, we are in strong opposition. Thank you. Next, please. My name is Julie Lane. I'm a lesbian Democrat from San Francisco, here as a member of Women Are Real, Women's Declaration International, and Women's Liberation Front. And on behalf of the coalition of No One Can Change Their Sex, the Coalition of Lesbians, Gay Men, and Bisexuals, and the Coalition of Sane People. I strongly oppose this bill. Thank you. Next, please. My name is Cynthia Cravens. I'm a recent candidate for California State Senate District 11. I'm with Women Are Real, and I am a lifelong liberal. I strongly oppose this bill. Thank you. Next, please. Beverly Talbot, liberal Democrat and lesbian from San Francisco. Concerned about gay and lesbian youth being told they are born in the wrong body simply because they are gender non -conforming. Just your position, please. In strong Thank you. opposition. Thank you. Next, please. Nicole Young, Moms for Liberty, Placer County, in strong opposition. I'm also representing Kimberly Ca Crabtree from Placer County, Christina Munoz, Dan Sturger, Gretchen Stevens, April Huckabee, and Amanda Kuntz. We are all in very strong opposition. Thank you, Ms. Young. Next, please. Cheyenne Kenny from Oakland, California, and student at UC Berkeley. Strongly oppose this bill. Thank you. Next, please. My name is Christensen, Vice President of the California Policy Center, in strong opposition to this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Brina Sheehy, representing Protection of the Educational Rights of Kids Advocacy, in strong opposition. Thank you. Next, please. Hi, Joni Greep, mother of a 15-year-old, 13-year-old, and 8-year-old in public schools. I'm a registered nurse. I'm a locally elected board trustee 
on my school district, and I'm here on behalf of Take a Stand Stanislaus, California Nurses United, and numerous individuals who could not attend today, the following names, Corinne Whitlow, Joseph Whitlow, Kelly Selman, Michael Gamez, Cassandra Gamez, Anthony Russell, Anna Russell, Vanessa Santos, Candace Wyruck, Laura Estrella, and Stephanie Degrees in strong opposition. Thank, Thank you. you. Next, please. Megan Short, mother of four school-aged children in strong opposition. Thank you. Next, please. Elizabeth Kenny, I come from Oakland, California. I represent poor moms against overreaching hands. This bill is going to destroy the position, trust please. every parent has. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I oppose it. Thank you. We see. Michelle Connor, on behalf of Frederick Douglass Foundation of California, as well as Concerned Women for America, representing moms and families across the state in strong opposition and respectfully ask for a no vote. Thank you. Next, please. Hello, my name is Margaret Arader. I am the mother of public school students. No child is safe when lies of gender ideology are taught in school. I am opposed to this bill. Thank you. Next, please. My name is Leander Lepp, and on behalf of myself and other LGBTQ friends um, who understand the value of parents, we oppose this bill. Thank you. Next, please. My name is Ava DuBose, and I am 13, and I oppose this bill. Thank you. Next, please. My name is Sabrina Williams. On behalf of Mom Army California, we strongly oppose this bill. Thank you. Next, please. My name is Courtney Graves, and I am part of Mom Army California, and we strongly oppose this bill. Thank you. Next, please. My name is Jody Buda. I've been an educator of California public schools for 25 years, a California public school administrator, and I'm against this bill, along with the South Placer Republican Women's Federation, Ladies of Auxiliary um, Board of Placer County, and Moms for Liberty. I'm against this bill. Thank you. Next, please. My name is Zachary Holsey, and as a high school student myself, I strongly oppose this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Charlotte Johnson, concerned parent. We parents deeply resent schools uh, making us parents the enemy. Is anyone even Your position, curious? please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Beth Bourne. I'm the chapter chair for Moms for Liberty, Yolo County. My daughter was socially transitioned at Davis. Here's a, a big article in the Sacramento Bee about how she grew out of her trans identity. Um, and I just want to let you know I strongly oppose this bill because my daughter was able to grow into a young woman. Thank you. Next, please. Good morning, Jessica Spade, mother of five, a trustee in a local Placer County school, and I strongly oppose this bill. Thank you. Next, please. Good morning, Chair Samara Palco with California Catholic Conference in opposition. Thank you. Next, please. Hello, Leslie Sawyer. Um, Moms for Liberty Shasta County, also here for Katie and author Gorman of Moms for Liberty Shasta County and Protect Kids California. We super strongly object to this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Good morning. My name is Palace Levitt. I'm the California co-chapter leader of Gays Against Groomers, and we strongly, strongly oppose this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Uh, Greg Burt, Vice President of the California Family Council and in opposition with our 70,000 uh, sub subscribers. Thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Pastor Brandon Campbell, Faith Baptist Church in Wheatland and Northern California Director for California Baptist for Biblical Values in opposition. Thank you. Next, please. Christine Campbell, um, a concerned parent in strong opposition. Thank you. Next, please. Peggy Delgado Fava, I'm a school board trustee, executive director for Bridge Network in Sacramento that works with at risk youth and also a survivor of early childhood trauma that dealt with gender identity issues. I'm also um, affiliated with Amen Clinics as a brain health professional. I oppose this bill. Thank, Thank you. you. Next, please. My name is Stephanie Suela. I'm a concerned parent, grandparent and a great grandparent. We are responsible for our children. Just so your position, please. please. So that is the law. I completely, strongly oppose it. Thank you. Next, please. My name is I oppose this bill. Thank you. Next, please. Allison Novello of Reality Encompassed Values for Our Women in Strong Opposition of AB 1955. Thank you. Next, please. 
Good morning, Senators. My name is David Bullock. I'm representing the San Fernando Valley, excuse me, SFV Alliance, LA County Chapter of Moms for Liberty, Mary C. Weller, Truth Exchange, the Facts Law, Truth Justice Law Firm, Taxpayer Oversights for Parents and Students, Informed Parents of Capistrano Unified School District, and your favorite, Goat Farmers for Better Government. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bullock. Next, please. Good morning. Uh, Mike Murray, parent from Rockland Unified School District, speaking on my behalf and on behalf of American Council. Please trust the parents in opposition to this bill. Thank you. Thank you. A any other witnesses in opposition coming from outside? Do we have any? I think we do. None? We're done? We're good. Okay, let, let us come back to the dais here uh, for questions or comments from my colleagues. Uh, if I could, if, I, I think we, if we could have the two primary witnesses come from each side, come back to the table, please. Sure. I understand. Welcome back. Uh, colleagues, questions, comments for the author regarding the bill? Uh, Senator Glazer. Assemblymember Ward, thank you uh, for your work on this issue. I know it's not an easy one, given the testimony we heard today. I just had some basic questions I wanted to ask you about. Um, does this, uh, is this bill consistent with the Education Code in regard to parents' access to their school records? Yes, it is. Does this bill interfere in a parent's communication with their child in any way? No, they are free to communicate with them in any way they see fit. Does this bill limit the ability of a counselor or a teacher to communicate with a parent if they thought it was in the student's best interest? It does not limit them. In fact, uh, it requires them to be able to do that if it's in the student's best interest. Does the school get involved in any medical procedures of a student? Never. Thank you very much. And in fact, I would add that that is always gender-affirming care uh, for minors. Is always, and the state is always subject to uh, parental um, consent. Thank you, sir. I'm happy to move the bill at the appropriate time. I appreciate that. Uh, Sarah Gazelas. Thank you, um, and I appreciate the questions by my colleague, um, Senator Glazer, and I just want to say thank you for bringing this forward. Um, I often say in these environments that I am also a mom of a public, stu student, uh, public school student, and um, I am absolutely in support of this bill because of what it means for the child. I actually have a, uh, a neighbor who is transgender and going through his experience and learning from his experience has not only uh, made me a better senator, but a better mother, just understanding what these children are going through and that there are not um, issues that prevent a parent from still having conversations with their child about their identity. And so with that, it is brave of you and the LGBTQ caucus for bringing this forward. And I just want to thank you and um, ultimately, of course, uh, support and I know it's already been moved, but um, would be happy to move it along. To move it again. Um, any other comments, questions, Senator Ochoa Bogan? Hello, Member Ward. <clears throat> First, I want to I want to uh, highlight the fact that it is encouraging to see that one thing that everyone has in common, whether you're in support or in opposition of this bill, is the fact that everyone cares about our children. And everyone is trying to do what they feel or understand to be best for that child. And I think we have to focus on that and not um, and understand the um, anger on either side of what uh, it entails as we move forward. And to understand that uh, when it comes to the root of all anger is fear. So as we navigate this, this very delicate subject, as we all have family members or friends, um, colleagues, um, or, um, or constituents that are members of the LGBTQ community that we learn um, necessarily, not necessarily accept, but, but most importantly, respect. Um, and I think that's important in the conversations that we have. And I'm trying not to get emotional on this part because <clears throat> I do see, I do see the needs. With that, as we are going to discuss this bill, I do have some questions and we're, we're gonna flow along with them very delicately. Um, but I do wanna preface some facts um, with this bill. Um, let's begin, and I wanna clarify because sometimes what I hear, and I try to be very objective in when I hear 
discussions on legislation. I try to hear both sides and try to facilitate um, the discussion because sometimes we get so involved in our own understanding and our own uh, biases that we can't see the other side. And sometimes what I see is communication that goes like this. So um, in, in pursuing the line of questioning, I'm going to be very, very, uh, uh, try to be as clear as I can be. So preface my discussion with a few facts about this bill. Currently, it's my understanding that there are eight school districts and one charter school that have passed a parental notification policy, and none of those policies require schools to reveal a student's sexual orientation. Am I correct? I believe that is correct. Okay. Um, and the reason I say that is because we're, we're talking and referring to this bill as an outing, and I think there is a misunderstanding that um, right now, currently, um, as there's a, 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 a contention between whether or not parents are informed or not informed, um, we're viewing that as a means of publicly letting people know where a child is uh, with their sexual orientation or their gender dysphoric. Um, and, and we're going to go through that really quick. Um, so what I understand is that- Senator, if I may? Yes, yes. Um, actually, yes. my notes uh, were miscorrect. Actually, the Chino uh, Unified School District does have a policy that is both on sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, and certainly, given the status of the ambiguity that we have today, any school district could be able to pass a similar policy as well. Similar, okay. So we're gonna request, I'm not sure if anybody here has the language on that because it's my understanding that, there, that, that it doesn't include that. Oh, I do. Hold on. I, I'm a Chino parent. And um, as well as the head of Our Schools USA, and the Chino policy requires that it is actually under an injunction at the moment. But when it was put into place, it requires parent notification if a child asks to use a restroom of um, a gender under other than what they're by um, on on their birth certificate. If they ask to play on a team. And also, if they ask to use a pronoun or a name in their official or unofficial records, um, that is how the policy reads in Chino. So, and, I, and, I, and that, that's the similar policy that has been adopted by districts across the state of California. So I believe Anderson has the same policy. There's a few minor um, changes across the state, but Chino is the only district that has ever actually implemented the policy um, fully. But again, it is under a temporary, it's under an injunction at the moment, and they have revised the policy as well, but that has not come forward or, or nothing has happened with the new revision. And Ms. Friday, you want to comment on this specific yes, issue? Please, um, because I wrote the policy uh, for, I wrote the parental notification policies. Um, so the parental notification policy for Chino Valley does not uh, touch on uh, gender, or sorry, sexual orientation at all. None of them do. I wrote the majority of them. They all deal with whether a school is participating in the social transition of a child. So when a child asks the school to change their name, when a child asks the school to call them different names or accommodate them by permitting them to use different bathrooms or a different sports team. It does not cover where a child, where a teacher hears that a child is transgender. There is no notification poly, uh, requirement whatsoever. It's only if the school participates in the social transition, which is a psychosocial medical intervention for the child. I appreciate that. Um, Ms. Hurst, to your point, that at least implicitly, that's exactly what's happening. If a parent is notified about a student's choice of restroom, correct? Correct. Okay. But again, it is under um, an injunction, but that was it. And it is if a student asks to even use anything. It doesn't have to be likes changed in the record. If a student asks a teacher to call them by a name other than what is on their official record or go by a pronoun other than what is on their official record, that would prompt a notification. Okay. Now, Senator Chobog asked for clarification so we can move on. I don't know if we provided it or not. But um, go ahead, Senator. Thank you. Um, so basically, change the rec or, so these policies only require parental notification if the student requests that the school participate in the social transitioning, correct? In the social meaning that they're they're requiring uh, different bathrooms or different 
uh, name, uh, pronouns, um, or if they want to use sex segregated spaces that don't align with their biological sex. If a student requests to go by a pronoun or a name other than yes. what is on their official yes. records, that prompts a notification okay. to their families, their parents. Yeah, that's, we wanted to make sure that we have that clear. Okay, so many school districts have adopted um, the the um, the secret social transition plans at their schools, um, basically not informing their parents of their ch child's struggles with gender dysphoria. The plans are a result of the Department of Education's frequently asked questions. Um, what is the um, what is interesting is that the Department of Education's lawyers have admitted in court that the secrecy, this is not my words, by the way, not my words, I'm reading here, that the secrecy policies are not law. AB 1955 <coughs> will require the, the schools to keep the students' gender dysphoria private from the parents unless the students give permission. Is that correct? So first I would object that a characterization that schools are adopting secrecy policies. Okay, privacy. Privacy, privacy policies are upheld under both the U.S. and the state constitution. And in fact, that is what has basically come under challenge in many of these court cases. Sure. And so as we are seeing ultimately general consistency that a constitutional right to privacy prevails over other questions that are being evaluated, still some ambiguity under some of the technical details when a certain element of that, that case needs to be um, uh, per, uh, permitted to be able to move forward. Um, so that, that's where we're trying to be able to clarify sort of the common baseline here through this bill. Okay. Um, <clears throat> And AB 1955 would apply to a student of any age, is that correct? Uh, it does apply uh, as general policy throughout school districts. However, the support direction under the fourth point of this bill is actually applicable for grades 7 through 12. But it is for, it could potentially apply for any, for any child, any age. It applies for any school or school district. Okay, got it. Um, <clears throat> okay, so... Under this bill, what would happen to a teacher or school employee if they tell the parents of a student's struggles with gender dysphoria or that they have adopted a transgender identity without the permission of the student? Nothing would happen under this bill if a teacher, as a mandated reporter, does feel that there is reason for concern. If there is an exhibition of you know declining performance in schools, um, struggles, mental you know clear um, attribution of mental health struggles, um, or the worst, of course, you know a self-reported you know uh, worry or risk of harm. For any of these reasons, using I think best sense judgment, there is an allowance for them to be able to exercise their duty as mandated reporters. But what this does do is it does not actually create or permit a overarching policy that prohibits forced outings. And that is the distinction there. You use basically an individualized discretion to be able to do that and it also would prohibit, I think, the activity, the overarching activity that we're seeing at some of our schools that are putting teachers in a very difficult place where they don't want to be the gender police. They want to teach. So when we say force outings, what you're really technically referring to is informing the parents. Not necessarily, because I don't think any, any policy or any teacher would um, publicly disclose a child's uh, sexual um, orientation or um, unless that child requests to be publicly referred to by certain pronouns. Um, I don't think any, any teacher would publicly inform the rest of the school district about the child's personal um, identity, right? You're, when you say of, outing, you're referring to parental notification, letting the parent know. Of, yes. Okay. So I'll, I'll sim simplify yes, but maybe summarize in, in later thoughts. Okay. Um, all right. So um, please, please, so Ms. Chow. Um, just to address, Senator, uh, your question about the uh, Attorney General statement in the Mirabelli case. Uh, so the Attorney General did say that the guidance issued by the California Department of Education is not binding, but that's true of all agency guidance. What the Attorney General did say is that the law that underlies the guidance, California's anti-discrimination law, 
um, California Constitution, that is what is enforceable. Um, the Attorney General has issued a clarification um, to say that uh, specifically, and so it's not true that the um, that the Attorney General has said that the CDE guidance is not enforceable. Briefly, Ms. Friday. They have said it four times. I have the court documents uh, that uh, the guidance is is guidance and it, it's not mandated by law. We need to talk about actually what the Constitution permits. Um, is there a privacy right between uh, a, a child and a parent? Um, do children have a privacy right against their parents? They do not. And that's what the federal court said in the Marabelli case, is that as between parents and children, there is no privacy right. So that is the Constitution of the United States. Also, the fourth, 14th Amendment provides that parents are the uh, get to care and custody and control of their children. So this law is unconstitutional as written. And uh, this statement in the bill that says this is just declaratory of existing law is a falsehood. I would love for the author to talk about what law it is actually that permits and, and requires schools to lie to parents. If I may, the Regino case, I believe you're the lead plaintiff, did have the lower court dismiss the case, finding under the U.S. Constitution that a parent's rights were not violated. That is on appeal to the appellate court. Um, so you can see the ambiguity right now at both the state and federal levels. Yeah, and I was, uh, so I, you know, I was kind of curious. I was look, trying to look a little bit more, and I found um, <clears throat> this um, article, Landmark Court Decision Affirms Parental Rights in California, <clears throat> which is, it had really interesting points and um, in which um, it said, amongst other things, that, um, and this is where I, I'm going, because I, I, I understand the intent of the bill, but I'm, the way that it's being formatted, I'm afraid that it's going to be found unconstitutional based on literally just um, the, the, the court findings that have written. And I apologize if you folks see my watermarks here, but I spelled something on the paper. Um, but the court, uh, so there's various uh, court cases that we have right now on the federal level, but part of it, there's some that said, the law's concepts of the family rest on the presumption that parents possess what a child lacks in maturity, experience, capacity for judgment required for making life's difficult decisions. Um, it just goes on and on and talks about the parental right uh, superseding the child's rights. Um, on here, so the, I'm, I'm reading all of these, and there's just so much, so much in already that's been decided upon federally, that states based on you know the Superior Court that it talks, and I'll be more than happy to share this with you um, afterwards of what I, I found, but it it actually supersedes the parents' rights, supersedes that of the child according to the federal cases, and I'll be happy to share with you uh, just this printout that I have on there. So um, overall. Um, I think we need to clarify that what we're trying to do when it comes to addressing our, our children's um, course is, is, is the fact that, one, parents do need to know. Um, I, I really, truly do believe, and I believe from um, my personal sphere of family and friends dealing with um, these type of um, health issues, behavioral health issues, whatever you, you know, transition issues, sexuality, um, I can tell you that no parent, when their child is going through this and knows that there is an, a, um, a risk for suicide or that there has been uh, suicide attempts, that, that those parents will not love that child regardless. They might not accept, but they will definitely uh, respect their child. And I know this, I know, I know this from conversations with uh, family members, friends that are going through this, and it might be right away, and there is anger for many, many parents. Um, at first, it might come out as anger, but I think a lot of it is that fear of what is going to come after um, what they're going to be dealing with. So it's, it's a very difficult issue. It really is. It's a very, not, I would say difficult, it's a delicate issue really is a delicate issue for, for parents. Um, on that end, um, I just wanted to cover one last point here. Um, and it has to do with the suicide 
uh, component um, and why I think it's important. So we understand that um, that there are elevated suicide risks for trans-identified youth. The figures go from 41% who have thought about suicide to 78% in last year's, uh, oh, let's see, in last year's bill, AB 1665, all the way to 87%, which was the figure from the Attorney General's complaint against the Chino Valley Hills. And what I beg to say is, when we look at the suicide attempts, um, they usually don't happen at school. It happens usually privately at home or um, somewhere else. And this is one of the reasons why I feel it's imperative the parents do know. Um, and, and once again, it's not regards to the, um, to whether or not you're gay, it's whether or not you're, 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 you're experiencing gender dysphoria. And I think that's the most important part for me is that if a child is in, in, in is in fact, going through that, that parents do need to be notified so that they can be aware if there's anything that could take someone's life in, at home, whether it's um, uh, medication or whether it's guns or whatever it may be, I think it's important for parents to be aware that that is available and that their child is going through this so that they can secure the home um, in order for those children to be safe. Um, and to really start having the conversations and the resources available to, to, for the families in order for them to be able to have and start those conversations. So there's components on the bill that I, that I truly, truly support, but fundamentally I think the biggest uh, holdback for me is, is informing those parents immediately that their child, not the fact that they're gay, I don't think many parents, you know, they might have problems, but the, the one of concern to me is the gender dysphoric, just because that one has medical uh, possibilities that could be, um, that are more impactful. Um, and so that's where I fundamentally can't, um, can't support this bill uh, today, but I understand the, uh, the effort that you're trying to, to, um, to address. Uh, today, and I hope I'm clear on that end and how sensitive I am to this subject um, at hand. And uh, I, I hope I hope that we can find more healing amongst both sides in um, in trying to build relationships on both sides. That we're trying to work towards the betterment and the well-being of our children, rather than vilifying each other and trying to understand the other side. Uh, viewpoints and concern, and I think that's 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 just my seed that I'm going to plant today on that end because we all we all do care about our kids um, as they go through um, this uh, stage in life. And with that, uh, thank you, thank you. Well, uh, Michelle, if it's a, if it's about the law, do you, do you want to add, it's please, clarification on the law? Yeah, um, just to address something that Ms. Friday said. So it is true that under the, under the Supreme Court, um, parents do have the right to care, custody, and control of their children. That is um, one of the most fundamental rights um, in, in this country. However, the Supreme Court has also said that that right is not absolute and that governments are able to enact laws and policies um, that touch upon that right when there is a narrowly tailored and uh, compelling government interest. Um, and Supre the Supreme Court has also found that uh, the creation of a safe and welcoming school environment is a compelling government interest. So I just wanted to um, put that finer point on something that Ms. Friday said. Briefly. Go ahead. Go ahead. It's Ms. Hurst. Fine. Yeah. I, oh, there we go. Um, you know, I appreciate um, what the senator was saying regarding parents. And so I wanted to just say that, you know, I am a parent and of course I'm involved and I think parents need to know and should know what's going on. This is not the way to find out because no matter how we feel as parents, the fact remains that when you forcibly out a child, it harms them. That's it. This is harmful. And I can tell you that 
I would not want my child forcibly outed to me because I know that's going to harm my relationship with my child. If my child is experiencing thoughts of suicide or struggling mentally, the school has policies in place that require them to notify me. So I know that my child is safe because if they're experiencing that, I will be informed. And finally, I just want to end by saying and pointing out that um, the senator brought up increasing suicide ideology thoughts. And I have in my organization partnered with the Rainbow Youth Project USA, and we have a crisis hotline for the state of California. And that was brought here when forced outing began. And since its implementation, that hotline has received over almost 1,500 calls just from Chino Valley Unified School District. And these are from affirming homes also, because these policies are harming all students. It is bringing dangerous situations because they are being mistreated when we see these policies being brought forth. They've also received almost 5,000 calls from the state of California. Their number one call is that the student is in crisis because they feel their government hates them, their government and their school board does not want them to exist. That is up from the year before, the crisis reason being for fear of being forcibly outed. So when you see these increased in numbers, I can tell you that that is true for the state of California as well as their national numbers. The increase is due to these policies. Ms. Friday, you wanted to make a point of law and I'd ask you to keep it brief. Yes, we about won't settle all of the questions around the actual law here today. Yes. Go ahead. So, so privacy is so important to understand. Uh, for a privacy right to exist, there needs to be an expectation of privacy. That's first and foremost. When a student tells everyone at school and all the teachers and all the uh, administrators and all the students know that the child has taken on a transgender identity, um, then that privacy right is lost. It's gone. And the only person who doesn't know about the child's transgender status is the parent. That is not called a privacy right. Um, and it is not permitted. So there is no privacy right when a child tells everyone. Everyone. And that is true with sexual orientation too. There is a case from the appellate court that says once the student talks about their uh, their sexual orientation or private issues and they've they've publicly announced it to the entire school, it is no longer private. So when a child tells everyone at the school to call them by a different name, use a different pronoun, treat them differently, that privacy right is gone. And the federal courts have found that to be true. Thank you. If I may, because I actually please, please. from personal experience, please. that is not true. Anybody's <laughs> ability to be able to decide for, for themselves to whom and the time and the manner they choose to be able to disclose any part of their identity is theirs to own always. When you are a member of our community or you love somebody who is a member of our community, you've seen this play out not necessarily the first time. I had to come out in college. I had to come out again when I moved to a new community. I had to come out again when I returned to graduate school. And so just because I had disclosed to some in spaces of who I was, did not mean that I had to be able to evaluate a new environment and decide on my own terms to whom I'm going to come out. Outing is a deeply personal situation, and it is important for them to be able to retain control over that in any situation. And, and let me let me ask a, a few questions. We're going to move on um, to First Assembly Member Ward. So, you know, the bill is about invalidating policies that require a school to notify a parent. Right? But, it, but there's nothing about the bill that prevents a school from acting in the best interest otherwise of a child. Is that correct? That exists in today's law. Fair enough. And, and so I guess to, to the opposition's point, you know, what, what, you, what we're talking about is, is honoring the self-expression of a child in, in the school environment versus I think the assertion has been made here uh, that certain school districts were taking an active role uh, in the transition of a gender dysphoric kid. That, that's not at all what you have in mind with this legislation. No, and that doesn't, that doesn't exist. Look, the school's obligation, and honestly our obligation as state lawmakers, is to make sure that all school districts have safe and supportive school environments with a common thread of guidance and, sub, and, and financial support um, that allows them to be able to do just that. And so anything, as we saw, I'm glad that our um, witness was able to bring up, you know, just, just, just let it crystallize for a second, the fact that in one school district that started this off just like 
last summer that we've had more than 1,500 calls to youth mental health crisis lines in just that narrow geography compared to 5,000 statewide. Now imagine if this is something that was a statewide policy, the number of students that would be in distress. It is this change last summer in injecting politics into local school boards that have actually caused more harm than good. So I agree. We have a lot that we agree on. And I know that you come from a really sincere and, and good place. And as a parent as well, I have a lot of faith in my kids. Um, I think they're actually, you know, smarter than any of us give them credit for. Um, but they're growing humans. And they have to be able to evaluate a lot of these questions. And they should also be able to, I hope, know that I have a trusting environment that, that they'd be able to bring these conversations back to the kitchen dinner table. And I, as a parent, invite those questions. So nothing I feel interferes with my parental obligations to be able to have those conversations. But I trust and I would want our school districts to be able to focus on an environment that allows a student to thrive and succeed and excel at their academic attainment. And, and so, at least by inference, you, you know, you're describing uh, or pointing to a, an opposite situation where, where a child does not feel comfortable uh, bringing those conversations to their parent. And Senator Ochoa made the point, and I, and I know it's, it comes from the heart, that, that all parents at some point are loving and will be accepting. But I think clearly that is not the experience uh, among uh, many children, which is precisely why they, they seek refuge uh, and want that sanctuary that a school might provide them because they don't feel comfortable at home. So if, if you or one of the witnesses could speak to that... You may start. I will just say again, let's not say all. Most parents are loving and accepting. And actually, most of these conversations happen at home. There are a number of parents who may have anger or may have shock or, you know, may have to process a lot of feelings. And that's understandable. And they do come around, um, as many of us have experienced. Um, but there are many who are kicked out who are ostracized, so you cannot say all. There is a, there is a healthy number, it is a very sad number uh, of youth who are uh, immediately expelled from that home environment. And this is why our foster care system is disproportionately made up of members of the LGBTQ community. This is why those who transition out of those systems, 40% of, of youth who are on our streets identify as LGBTQ youth because there is a disproportionate effect on those youth who are, do not have a supportive environment. This is why the Trevor Project's own studies show that 40% of youth do not feel they have a safe and supportive environment at home because maybe they've heard something. Maybe they've heard the way that parents talk about others, right? Not even realizing that it's somebody in your own orbit who you do love. And that is the risk that they have to really walk. And sometimes you feel like talking to a student, a peer, or maybe even a teacher who you do trust is a gentle way to sort of te test some waters about being accepted. Yeah, yeah, I, I also wanted to speak to the logistics of this. So like, in theory, the, the policy that my school passed says that within 72 hours of noticing that a student is non-gender conforming by choosing a new bathroom or asking to be called a different pronoun, we are to notify their parent. Logistically, that is a nightmare because how do we do that? With, and we're told we can send an email, we can make a phone call, or we can send a letter home. I, as a parent, cannot imagine what it would be like to receive a letter in the mail from a teacher that says, I think your child is A, B, C, D, for whatever reasons. I have no knowledge in how to deal with things like that. I, I don't have the background. I don't have the capacity to understand this delicate topic to write that letter home to a parent. The logistics there don't make sense. And asking us to do that puts us in a very precarious situation, not only with the student, but with the parents as well. Because what if you get an angry parent that thinks that you're um, overstepping? Or what if that letter that you send home goes to an uncle or a friend or a grandparent who's not accepting? You don't know who's gonna get the mail. You don't know who's gonna get the email. There are things that, are, that we are being asked to do that are absolutely unrealistic and the logistics of it are, in my opinion, um, cruel. I appreciate that. And, 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 and Ms. Friday, I, I want to be clear, you're a technical witness for issues of law. Is that correct? So is, is this 
Is this about a matter of law or something else? Well, it's about it's about the law because the parental notification policy does not require a teacher who notices that a child is going by a different name to notify the parents. It's only if the student asks the school to participate in that social transitioning by calling them a different name, by changing records. But, but to be clear, that, that can take an informal uh, form, right? Where a, a stu no, there's no form that no, a student has to fill out, right? No, so if a student it, makes a request, let me finish, uh, to a teacher, you know, that, that is, that's a request to respect their self-expression as opposed to naturally being a, a request to participate in, a, in their transition. The participation in the transition is when an adult agrees that you are born in the wrong body and that you are transgender and that you are actually a boy. But, that but is an the adult is not necessarily agreeing to that by simply ad, 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 according that child the respect of the self-expression that goes with the preferred pronoun. I think the doctor can speak to what affirmation is. Not even remotely. Accurate. What What is not accurate, So when doctor? you say to a kid, oh, yeah, okay, Johnny, you're Sally now. No, 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 no. From that kid's perspective. If the kid says, I'd like to be called Sally, and you say, okay, I'll call you Sally, that, that is not saying by any means that you are now Sally. It's simply saying, I will when respect your figure, right to self-expression. No, it, it's not that simple, sir. When an adult figure, especially a teacher, starts playing uh, into any in any way into the um, perception of reality of the child, and that perception of reality is still under a great question. The child is going, oh, they think black and white. Adult, adult is saying X. This is this is so they're they're buying into it. So how, how, uh, then, that, how then should we think about modes of play where where a child wants to play dress up? It's a male child wants to wear female clothes. That's an entirely different situation. How is it so sir? different? It's different because the child is uh, that's taking place predominantly. At a much younger age, when the child is is exploring a lot of things, but it's not something where the child actually verbally says, "I want you to start." I, I think I'm a I think I'm a girl in a boy's body, and I, I'd like to speak to the point about this fear of parents. And I this is 33 plus years of being a pediatrician and dealing with the child protective services and taking care of hundreds of kids who have been abused in various ways, both physically and mentally. And I can tell you that the vast majority of the kids, even when I feel that they should be taken out of the home, are not taken out of the home because the CPS folks seem to think that in general, the parents are the better place for these kids. I've learned over time that in general, they tend to be compared to a lot of the foster situation. Yeah, but, but to be now, clear, but, that's, but that's a wholly separate That's a wholly separate conversation. Fair I enough. got it. But the reason I bring that up is because this bill is cutting off the legs of parents who the vast majority of times cared desperately about their kids, even when they are a little bit dysfunctional, the parents, I mean. And when they and 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 it's it's accurate to say suicide takes place in the home almost always. So if the parent doesn't know about this, if the parent is totally totally kept in the dark over what's going on, yeah, the kid is at far more risk. And oh, by the way, the kids who start doing this transition are far more likely to enter the medical, the medical parts and the surgical parts, and and the the only. The only giving the uh, devil's advocate to the folks who think this is a good idea, the only justification that was ever really brought up that said, oh, we should probably do this is to prevent suicide. And now we see that's not happening. In fact, the people who are going through this transition are more likely to commit suicide as adults. And that's the reason that the Dutch closed these and the UK closed these and nearly all of Europe has closed this. But and that's, doctor, that's fine. That's fine. But I, I think wait, no, I mean, that's a huge deal. I, I'm, I'm saying it's I appreciate your you need testimony. To consider. I appreciate it. I'm not saying it is fine. Uh, I, I think we're going to get to a point of kind of diminishing returns here, very, very briefly. Yeah, I just wanted to bring up the fact of um, a not what if situation. Um, this situation happened in our family, and my daughter was 11, and she was confused, and um, they kept it a secret from me. And what happened with her was. Um, it actually made her more confused and more damaging. And um, everybody talks about, you know, the bullying. Well, she was bullied at school. 
with no support at home. But, but she, 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 she kept was it. She was loved the most by us, and she wasn't even, she was keeping a secret from us. She kept a secret from you. Right, and, and this is really the operative question, right, uh, Assembly Member Ward, which is, you know, th there is at least you can infer a reason uh, or, or a, a basis for a child keeping a secret for a time from their parents about their preferred. Well, children right keep there. secrets all the time. Sometimes they sneak a cookie, you know, and it doesn't mean uh, that you're I a bad think parent because of a, that. That's a, not a comparable situation. So, uh, the, you know, so this is the question, right? Uh, you know, and I, I guess, and I have a question for Dr. Uh, Lormier, is, you know, I think you can make a, a distinction, I believe, and I believe that's what the, the, the legislation is trying to do, between respect for self-expression and identity versus active participation in gender transition. So how, how, what, what's a line uh, that shouldn't be crossed for you, doctor, in a school environment? Is it simply not recognizing the preferred pronoun or is it something beyond that? When an adult in a uh, position of authority is clearly buying into the uh, perception that the child is the different um, uh, gender, and that is crossing a line. Now, how that is manifest on a day-to-day -day basis is real difficult to pin down in any situation. I can just tell you from my own experience, after taking care of hundreds of kids, now thousands of kids, that when a teacher, even the teachers they don't like, um, agree to a certain mode of perception of reality, the kids start saying, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I, I, I must be right about this. Instead of an adult taking the time to say, hey, Johnny, what, what's going on? But, but, but again, there's nothing about this, this legislation that prevents the teacher from having that conversation. No, no, there's not. Right. But the thing is, there is uh, in this legislation a, a preventive of the teacher actually recognizing this is going a little too far. I need to tell mom and dad what's going on. But that teacher in, in sort of conversing with the student could secure that student's permission to talk to a parent, right, under this legislation. I don't think what, what this What this bill, as I understand it, does is it prohibits the blanket requirement of notification in that instance of, right? So, Ms. Hurst, and, okay, good. I know you asked me a question about, you know, kids being out of their homes, and I first want to start off by saying that through my work with the crisis hotline, we have had children in the state of California this past year who are kicked out and homeless because of being outed at home. So I do want to make that point. Um, I also wanted to state that if a child is struggling mentally and in harm or being bullied, those are situations where parents are notified. That exists outside of the privy of this policy in and of itself. That's already a policy that exists, and parents absolutely have the right to be involved in that, and they are. Um, and I just, it is my understanding the doctor told the National Catholic Register, he's a pediatric gastroenterologist who does not specialize in gender affirming care. So I think that it's taking what he's saying is maybe not, um, I, I, I have concerns I about some of the treatment. So you're, you're the opposition witness. We'll give you all the respect uh, that you're due as the witness, but understood. You, can, I just make a, can I just make a point about that? Um, first of all, the idea that a child is, uh, that a child can trust what a parent is going to say or what a, a school board is going to say is a, is a real big question, okay? When they talk to an adult and they reveal something to them that is in some way potentially harmful, they, uh, we, we as adults need to make decisions about kids all the time. And I don't believe for a moment that schools are are going to rethink or think logically necessarily and particularly about the bullying issue i've had you know we've all been through schools here i've been through public school here plenty of people in here have been through the public schools and private schools and i've never seen a, a kid getting bullied very seldomly seen a kid getting bullied who any of any of the administrators or, or teachers talked about it? 
They don't talk about it. And these kids... I, I'm not sure. Well, what's the point you're making here? The point I'm making is that to say that they're instructed to inform anybody that the kid is getting bullied, that's a nice thing to say. But in but reality, again, that doesn't again, happen. Separate, separate policy, separate conversation right? this, this about bullying. right? And, and I, I think the, the evidence is quite clear uh, that LGBTQ plus and transgender kids do, in fact, get bullied, whether or not you see it. That the uh, school board is going to be in the uh, in the best position to report that the school uh, board or the really school, the teachers, whoever they don't uh, they frequently fail a lot of the time. To that tell doesn't anybody. mean we shouldn't aspire to better than that. <laughs> Only on a question of law. Question of law. So what everyone seems to be missing is currently almost at every school district, there's a policy called AR 5145.3. And this policy requires that schools keep a transgender student's transgender identity secret unless the student says that, that it's okay to reveal it. So it is the child that is making the decision. The child who could be four, five, six, the child who could be suicidal, the child who could have other mental health issues, the child is the yeah. one dictating whether this is revealed. However, everyone at the school knows, except for the parents, the parents who are the only ones who are able to, to keep them safe. And Aurora's daughter was told by the school to lie to her about her transgender status. To lie to her own mother. That's what happens at the schools. I, okay, I, I, and that may have happened in that instance, but I'm not sure that's what always happens. Mr. Trish, very quickly, I know you have something you wanted to add. Um, I know we're talking a lot about kids' perspectives, and since there's not a child here, I'd like to read an excerpt from a student's perspective shared in this building earlier this month. He, Kai said, had I not had a single supportive adult in my life, his teacher, I never would have been able to find the strength to come out to my family or teach them what I had learned about who I am. Without a supportive adult, I would not have had my supportive parents beside me here today. And what these policies really end up doing and what we saw in Chino Valley is that the students who need the most support actually then closet themselves and they are unable to seek support. They are unable to come to the supportive adults in their life and teachers and let them know they are being bullied for their gender identity and their transgender status because out of fear that then they will be forcibly outed. And so we are isolating these kids who need our help the most. And I think I would hope we, everyone in this room, no matter how we feel, we can set that aside and look at the facts. And the fact is when you forcibly out kids, we prevent them from getting help and support and it is harmful. The data shows it over and over repeatedly, and families that are affirming do not want these policies because we know that when our child is forcibly outed, it is harmful to them and it harms our relationship. And as a mom, of course, I want my kids to come to me, and I try to ensure that will happen by open communication with my teachers, with the school, and with my children, explicitly letting them know that I will love and accept them no matter what. I speak positively about LGBTQIA issues, and I know that when they come to me, it'll be done in a healthy, communicating, supportive way. So let me ask briefly. This has to do with uh, the point about being a pediatric gastroenterologist in that role. A big chunk of the kids I take care of are adolescents who are, have belly aches, who I need to do a big di uh, uh, differential and workup on for their belly ache. And the a majority of them are otherwise ner uh, normal kids physiologically who are neurotic and upset and, uh, and anxious. And I've, and I've seen over the course of just the last three years a huge increase in the number of these kids being trans-identifying female adolescents who often will be coming into my office. And this isn't just a one-off. I've seen a bunch of these kids like this. They're dressed in real bulky clothes, oversizing, oversized. And when you really get into talking with them at length and you get to know them over time, they just want to be a little girl again. And they don't want to be seen because they've had too many advances from nefarious adults. And the flip side is true. I've had kids like this who come into my office 
who are uh, who are trying who are trying to find a way to be a different sex because they don't they don't give the attention that they want in the given sex, and it has nothing to do with what they really what okay. their transgender. I appreciate experience. your point, but the real question here is what happens at school, right? So so. Assembly member Ward, I, I guess there's been a lot of discussion around gender dys dysphoria, but the point was also made that, un unfortunately, because of these policies, LGBTQ or questioning kids get caught up in this and are forced to be outed uh, as part of it. Is, is there any way that you know, would you make a distinction, like within the legislation, between the gender dysphoria portion versus simply respecting, you know, a kid's sort of evolving sexual identity. I mean, I assume you can't, no. but how do you, how do we think about that? Let's be clear because we've gone down a tangent, a related tangent, but that's not what this bill does. It is not about gender dysphoria and it is not about medical decisions. That is covered in separate conversation and is very also clear in today's law in California. This is about harmful policies and when we are going to have a local district policy which is forcibly is outing students. And it furthermore, and I think to some of these points as well, actually is proactive in its way to be able to provide district resources that really take that conversation out of the classroom. Referrals for parents, guardians, families, and students to support groups, space, safe spaces, uh, re reference to anti-bullying and harassment policies, counseling services. These are appropriate interventions and support networks that aren't necessarily for the classroom for the teacher to be able to do their job, and that is to teach the subjects for which their 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 their, their job is uh, is directed. So I just I don't want to distract. I think the core obligation of this legislation from what it is intending to do, separate from other questions that I know intersect with this population. I, I and I, I appreciate that. I'm going and I'm glad you brought us back to the purpose of this legislation. Uh, and so, Senator Wilk, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, I appreciate our conversation yesterday, and I appreciate the way that, that you're handling this. And you already know that I'm not going to be, be supportive. And th these may be bad or rogue school districts, but I think, parental, in my view, parental rights trumps you know bad policy there. It's much easier to change school board members I mean, if we got judged on the job we do as policymakers, we, we should all be out of here because we've not done a good job for California. But that's a side. So this is going this is going to become law. So I know that. So I just was reading through the bill last night. So I just I just got a couple sections I want to read and then just just so I have it on the record. So and I, I think you're going to I'm not trying to you're going to you're going to have answers to all this. I just want to kind of get on the record. Uh, so I'm going to read this, read the section, then ask, ask the question. So. In section two, uh, K1, it states teachers and school staff can provide crucial support to LGBTQ plus young people and play an important role in encouraging them to seek out appropriate resources and support. So a couple questions. So under the bill, if an elementary school, because we've already identified that it could start kindergarten up, uh, if an elementary school student identified as questioning and said they didn't want their parents to know, and wanted to learn more about gender identity and potentially transitioning, what would an educational provider be required to do to comply with that law? So um, the subsection that you had referenced is part of our findings and declaration, yeah. which establishes, you know, you, we know how to write a bill. Um, and yes, it's just an affirmative statement that uh, and it's not exclusionary of other statements as well, that teachers and students and staff can provide crucial support to young people. And so to your question, what would the direction that I think references also is highlighted in the analysis uh, a teacher to be able to do, and that is to be able to access resources that are regularly updated, which are able to be able to provide uh, for serving pupils in grades 7 through 12, a menu of options that provides for support groups, safe spaces, uh, existing policies like anti-bullying, harassment, suicide prevention policies, counseling services, a gamut of options yeah. um, that can come with that. So, again, they can be able to decide for themselves and hopefully, hopefully take that home to the parents and have these conversations. Right. Well, you and I've already talked about. I know because I know you're a great parent, and I know you and your and your spouse. And and I haven't met your kids, but I'm sure that they're great. And we know that vast majority of parents love their kids and, and be very supportive. And there is some that that aren't. 
And so uh, sometimes I think we uh, penalize the 97% that are good to go after the 3% who are bad. So I got just one, one other question as it relates. So under the Federal Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, parents have an absolute right to access any and all public records related to their child. So under uh, FERPA, uh, would parents be entitled to access information regarding the child's gender identity and pronouns? I do have a response for that. Um, can, you, can you read the... Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, read it again. Yeah, yeah. So under federal law, parents have an absolute right to access all, all the information. So would they have access to that? Yes, under FERPA, they have access to school records. So um, if the school, if the student uh, changed their identity or whatever, is, this, is the school district obligated to put that in the official records? Any official record, say, uh, and I think that would include uh, medical, uh, say at the school nurse's office, um, any, anything that is, that is a record would be eligible under FERPA. Okay, great. Appreciate that. Uh, again, I'm not going to be able to support you uh, today because just conceptually, I, I think it, go, it goes too far. But I really appreciate the dialogue we've had and, and the way you conduct yourself and trying to bring the temperature down because these are, as you know, sensitive issues. So I just, just appreciate you, but just can't be there with you today. Thank you. And, and let me also point out, Senator Wilk had a bill earlier this year that, that would ensure that parents had access, or everyone has access, to uh, instruction materials that are provided by school. I'm I, sure I, it's going to get killed in these. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I was happy to vote for it. Um, and so, so we're going to wrap up here. And let, let, let me say, I, I, I want to you know, honor the uh, sort of assertion by all of the participants that you know, the parents do love their kids, and they want the best for their kids. Um, and that's that's kind of the irony here um, that this bill is not really intended for those parents who have a relationship with those kids that allows for that sort of free uh, and loving exchange of information. This is for a very different situation where, where students, uh, children do not have that comfort uh, and find in school the only place where they can actually uh, sort of exercise and affirm their gender identity at that time in their lives, which is a challenging time. And so it's for those kids uh, who are going through, you know, an awkward and very excruciating time that, that I think this bill is necessary. And there is, as I understand, there's nothing about this bill that prevents a, a school or, or teachers from acting in the best interests of those children. It's we're trying to ensure a situation where we don't require as a blanket matter uh, the schools to insert themselves in a way that's inappropriate that may inflame uh, those tensions at home. And so with that, uh, I, this is clearly a big deal. Um, and uh, I, 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 okay, <laughs> Ms. Friday. What, what FERPA and, and the way it works in the real world, um, because I am a licensed attorney, and so when my daughter came out as a transgender child, I did a FERPA request to test the school to see if the school would lie to me one more time. I requested under FERPA all of my daughter's records. And I knew that they were calling her by a male name and using male pronouns. And I did not receive one of those records. And I work with hundreds of parents and I tell them to send the same FERPA request. And they know that their child is being called by a different name and they never get those records. I guarantee you, they never get those records because they create a secret file that is held, be, held in a, a administrator's office. So they keep that information secret from parents. So let me, that's fair. It says, Assembly Member Ward, does this bill allow for a school to keep a secret file or otherwise not adhere to no, FERPA? No, that, that that's blasphemy. There, this law does not supersede FERPA, right? State laws do not supersede federal laws. We, we understand this. And I'm sorry, if, uh, if there was a record they did not provide for you, then you probably have grounds to be able to challenge them further on that, but they should have provided you all of the records that existed. Is there anything implicit in your bill that would encourage a school Absolutely not to adhere not. federal law? Fair enough. So, uh, having said that, you know, this, this conversation, and I've, I've given it a very deliberate kind of long leash, because uh, I think it's important that we hear both sides and we hear it fully, um, and I think we have today, and I appreciate the input of both the support witnesses, the opposition witnesses, and all the members of the public here, um, I will be supporting the bill today. 
um, and I hope that we will continue uh, sort of working on these conversations to the satisfaction of all parties. And so with that, Assembly Member, if you'd like to close. Senators, I want to thank you for your time this morning for a very important issue. Uh, I know that the conversation does need to continue, and because there are a lot of um, related um, points that are worthy of consideration, um, that this deserves to be able to continue. So I'm grateful for your um, attention this morning. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is, is over the last year, we have seen uh, an explosion of um, unrest and, and ultimately harmful policies across our state. And as I want to also highlight and thank um, our state superintendent of public instruction, who went right down uh, to Chino Valley and was forcibly evicted from that school district's conversation, unable to be able to contribute as our lead, uh, as our uh, lead for the Department of Education, our attorney general, who has, um, through his leadership, been able to show uh, a testing of a lot of these important questions as well, and some of those are not fully resolved through our legal system. But where this brings us here today is an affirmation that I think on, on, uh, on several fronts. One, much of the court discussion has been upholding I think superior elements of the law that respect a right to privacy and really try to de-emphasize, I think, the politicization of a lot of this policy making. Two, we've got to remember that nothing in this bill actually prevents parents from having that conversation with their with their um, uh, their children, uh, and that should be done in a time and a place and a manner. Uh, that is appropriate to them as well, so they can have a sense of conversation. And I encourage them to have those conversations, and if a child is expressing any confusion or question or just, you know, how their, how their, how their development is going, I, I, I would hope that they would love them unconditionally. Third, it makes sure that through all of this politicization and, and, and local district noise that we're seeing that we're just getting back to where we were a few years ago, which is allowing teachers to teach and be able to provide a safe and supportive environment in which to thrive. Because when that doesn't happen and that our own research is showing those students that are feeling that they don't have a safe and supportive environment are less likely to continue on to higher education, more likely of harm to themselves, and the spiral effect downward I think is showing in the number of youth that we see on our streets um, and those that are having mental health challenges as young adults and even latent effects into full adulthood. So for all of these reasons, I believe that the Safety Act as we have provided here today is well grounded, um, not just in its conceptual principle and what some of us feel are best approaches, but also in the data that we've seen over the last 12 months as this has exploded in, our, in, in some home communities. And so for that, I ask that you let the conversation continue to be able to work on some of these issues. I am always revisiting my own legislation to make sure that we are getting this right. And I'm willing to, and open to be able to think about some of the deep and, and, and uh, fundamental questions that, that especially this bill, but any of my pieces of legislation work on. But there are principles, and I think those are much data-driven for me, that we have to draw a line on. And ultimately, this is about protecting our youth. And that's why I've introduced this here today, and I'm grateful for your consideration. I respectfully ask for your I vote. Thank you. Uh, and I know we had a motion from what seems like a very long time ago from Senator Glazer. Uh, and with that, Madam President, please call the roll. File item 1, AB 1955, Ward. Motion is due passed to the Senate Health Committee. Newman? Aye. Newman, aye. Ochoa Bogue? No. Cortese? Aye. Cortese, aye. Glazer? Aye. Glazer, aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Gonzalez, aye. Smallwood Cuevas? Wilk? No. Wilk, no. Uh, that measure now has four votes, four